Welcome back to Turtles All the Way Down. Some questions. How did you arrive at this video? Was it a decision you made given several choices? Were you pressured to make that decision? Could you have chosen an alternative video at that moment instead of clicking the link that led you here? These are questions of free will. This video asks, do we have free will? Let's start off with what we mean by free will. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines this as the freedom of humans to make choices that are not determined by prior causes or by divine intervention. Okay, this sounds a little circular. Its definition for free will uses the word freedom to define it. Seems a bit suspect, even if we clarified freedom as instead to say a person who is neither hindered nor compelled to decide something. Looking at all of the definitions out there for free will, they either appear to be circular or are vague in their meanings. However, if we are really to get anywhere with whether or not we do have free will, this absolutely requires us to know what we mean by it. The way most people I've seen use the term and what I feel gets to the central point of free will is this. When alternative decisions are presented to a person, that person makes a choice that could have been otherwise. They will subsequently feel as if the decision was freely made by themselves. That is free will. I'll go with that definition. Free will. Decisions made that if the tape of time were reversed back, could have possibly been different. The controversy in this, then, is obviously not in will, as it is clear people make decisions and produce actions all of the time. Will or volition is simply the decision or act made. The real controversy in questions about free will are those related to the free or freedom part so the effective question then becomes, are we really free in our decisions? Let's examine this question a little more with some simple illustrations. A billiard ball is at rest on a table. It is hit by another and it then moves a certain direction and in only that direction and at a certain speed and at only that speed. Can we say the ball had freedom to move another direction or speed? Obviously not, as classical physics can show. If we were to rewind time, it would have done the same thing over and over again. Let's go up another level of complexity. A paramecium is a complicated, single-celled organism that can move on its own. It is introduced into an environment filled with bacterial food Upon approaching the food, the paramecium detects a barrier. When this happens, its surrounding cilia, which allows it to move, reverses its motion away from it. This is called its avoidance reaction. Was the paramecium free to make this movement? Again, no, it wasn't. And this has been known to microbiologists. It is something akin to our reactionary experience of getting hit in our knee with a physician's reflex hammer. Our leg unconsciously reacts and swings forward. Moving on up. My dog has a special squeaky toy she goes to to play with whenever she feels energy to play. But this is not her only toy and not the only squeaky one. She has plenty to choose from. When several of those toys are thrown for her to play with, she almost invariably goes for her special one, leaving the others to gather dust. We are beginning to see something a little more familiar now when it comes to alternative decision making. Was my dog free in deciding to play with her special squeaky toy? She was presented with several alternatives to choose from but I could have predicted for you which of them she would choose before she did so. I certainly cannot get inside of her head to experience what her decision-making process, if she had any, was like, but I did see how she stared at several of the toys and moved her head from one to the other, sniffing some and leaving others alone 
before deciding to pounce and chew on her favorite. Was she feeling as if she was freely making a choice? When she made her choice, did she experience a sense of control in her decision? I would venture to go out on a limb and say that yes, she did feel as if she made a decision on her own and that she was in control of it, however canine-like that may be. Now, at our level, you are walking alone an oceanfront pier that stretches out to a deeper part of the beach alone and with no one else around. You, however, see someone within your swimming distance out beyond the pier in the water struggling to swim. They are gasping and yelling for help with what little breath they still have. It is apparent that they do not know how to swim and are drowning. They may die if they are not helped immediately. You are in a position to jump into the water to help them out. Do you? In your decision-making process, you may think, if I get out to them, they may struggle so much that they may pull me under the water and drown me in order for them to stay afloat. Or you may think, I am the only one who can help them survive. If I do nothing, then they will certainly die. These thoughts weigh on your conscience. You are free to make a decision. Either way, the consequences will be substantial. This is an important free will scenario, as there are no external forces directing which alternative to choose from, only ethical and internal considerations. In either case, a flood of neural circuitry in your brain is lighting up. Crisscrossing networks are communicating with each other. These are the substances of thoughts. Vast numbers of brain neurons firing in sequences and patterns. Neuroscience has shown that this is what our emotions and thoughts do when we are actively experiencing. This is what weighing alternatives and memories and consequences look like. Prior to the moment of our volition to jump in or run away, these neural networks are very active. All of this firing was first elicited by the shouts and splashes from the helpless person, of which we had no control over. Whatever decision we happen to make is determined by thoughts and memories that are boiling up to the surface of our consciousness. Many free will advocates, and this is the important punchline, believe that these thoughts, memories, etc. are all somehow being constrained called upon or adjusted through some kind of control that is independent of these deterministic neural firings, such as through an invisible mind. For if they weren't, and these thoughts were indeed being controlled through only neural firings and normal physiobiological controls, then we are back to our ordinary deterministic model of no free will. Which neurons are firing and how they are doing so are determined by what happened immediately prior to those firings, such as the state of our hormone levels, the memories we had prior to that, the psychological temper we were in, how tired we were prior to that, etc. All of which we had no control over at that moment. No control of, only witness to. There happened to be a brain landscape in which the entire stage was already determined and set for us prior to that moment. The feeling we have of making the decision to jump in, say, as being our own freely made decision, is just that. Only a feeling. The decision was made for us as our consciousness observes it doing so. When the act was done, our consciousness becomes aware of the decision and feels a sense of control or ownership over it. If we were able to see microscopically what it is that produces these cascades of neuronal firings, we will find nothing happening that was uncaused. This neuron fired due to its action potential threshold being overtaken by the firings of the other hundreds or thousands or so other connecting neurons. Those too fired due to similar circumstances. 
Each action of the brain is determined by what occurred shortly before that action. Where does free will come in? What does or would free will look like at this level? Is free will the firing of neurons without cause? In other words, does it come from a neuron or neurons that just fire on their own without a prior push from anything before? If this is so, then a decision made in this way would be one that was uncaused. It would be a decision made without any reason or influence whatsoever. But a decision made without reason and without thought is just a random one. Are random decisions what constitute free will? Most advocates of free will do not think so. Most people who believe in free will think that a decision is made based upon reflection and thought prior to making it, that it isn't a random thing. If decisions are not spontaneous like this, then free will means that a decision is caused, period. If a decision is caused, then something influenced or determined the decision to go that way. Is that being free? If you were to rewind the tape of time to replay that volitional moment, then obviously the same exact determined influence will be right there. The same forces, the same strengths, the same line of causes prior to it. The same exact decision would still have been made. Otherwise, it would have to have been a different stimulus that pushed the decision in an alternative way, and that stimulus does not exist in our rewind. So you were not free after all in that decision. It only felt so. I have read a lot about what compatibilists say about free will. Compatibilists are those who believe in both determined outcomes and free will. They believe in both, which to me has never made much sense. The compatibilists either must 1. Redefine free will to be something different than what most feel to be so, or 2. They change the level at which determined actions take place, or 3. They feel as if the randomization of nature explains free will. But again, a randomly determined action is not what most define as a freely made decision, as there does not appear to be any agent ownership in that action. Our decisions are turtles all the way down. The top turtle is standing because it sits on the turtle below it, but it too is standing because it rests on the one below it all the way down. Free will advocates seem to want the top turtle, the decision maker, to push out all the lower turtles from below her and claim that her standing exists all by herself. Nature doesn't work that way. So at this point, I really think the burden of proof is on those making the positive claim. Those who believe in the existence of free will, they need to make their case. I expect a lot of pushback on this topic, as would be normal. It is a contentious issue. But most of the resistance comes from those who probably fear the consequences for believing that free will does not exist. Most religions, for example, hold free will as the epitome of the human mind and is sacrosanct and therefore must be defended. Free will believers will ask, won't we then not be responsible for our actions then, say? If murderers are not responsible for their crimes, won't we let them free? How can we protect others? Aren't people who have terrible lots in life just lazy people? They must be responsible for their circumstances, right? Etc. Etc. I am not worried about any of these fears, as they can be answered and addressed. But that's for another time and another video. My main point in this discussion was to ask if free will even exists. 
Finding that truth should not in any way be influenced by the consequences of that answer. If we really want to face reality, we must do so regardless of what it tells us. We can make adjustments to our society and institutions if need be afterwards. But it is truth that we seek. We shouldn't be fearful of what it tells us. In June 1633, the Church, through the Roman Inquisition, declared Galileo's teachings to be, quote, vehemently suspect of heresy, unquote, and threw him under arrest. Galileo's teachings? That we are not the center of the universe, that the sun is the center of the solar system, and we orbit it, not the other way around. The church was fearful that Galileo's ideas were absolutely heretical to God's universe, and as such, forced Galileo to recant. Legend says that he did, but then muttered under his breath, and yet it moves. Galileo found the truth regardless of the consequences, and yet society has thrived and is better due to his brave insights, despite society not being the center of the universe in which it lives. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious. And I'll see you in the next video of Turtles All the Way Down. Bye for now.